This might seem a bit weird that I'm not holding the book as a prop, but I'm recording this video before the 8th volume releases physically. The Kindle edition is about 7 books ahead, so if you don't mind digital releases, it's probably your best way to go so you're not waiting for physical copies. Anyway, I know last volume felt like a bit of a climax, what with that whole interduchy tournament having a massive incident and the ominous foreshadowing stuff, but that's a mere opening act compared to the crazy stuff we're about to see go down in the next few books. We're starting our trek towards the end of part 4 in today's video, but before we even take one step on that journey, why not hit the subscribe button while you're here? And also we have merch on sale, you can always check that out. And now that you've made it through my obligatory plugs, let's get on into part 4 volume 8. The prologue begins from Melchior's perspective. It's right after he and his attendants got word that Sylvester and Florencia are almost back, he doesn't get many visitors, and since he couldn't go to the playroom because he's not baptized, he's a bit extra lonely this winter. His head attendant, Sagarect, suggests inviting them to a tea party to practice his social skills while they wait for their luggage to be unpacked, and that's a great idea. Sylvester and Florencia stop by, and Melchior does his best to follow proper etiquette. He even gets some praise, but when the topic comes down to it, he's a little too vague, leaving his parents acting as instructors a little unsure on how to answer his questions about the interduchy tournament. That's when Sagarect covers and brings up how worried the Archducal couple was about this year's socializing. They talk about how Wilfried and Charlotte handled the lower duchies, where Frembeltag visited. Melchior remembers that's where his mom and Sagarect are from, the latter following Florencia when he became a parent they were going to be on the losing side of the Civil War. But the main topic here is how Melchior's cousin, Rudiger, graduated. The concept of cousins confuses Melchior a bit because he's suddenly struck by how big the world is beyond his room. But he also has cousins in Arnsbach as well. Not that he's really going to meet them before the Academy, but the simple fact that they share blood makes him feel closer to them. Sagarek asks how Frembeltag is doing since he knew they were suffering from crop shortages. But Rudiger traveled for spring prayer, and apparently the Archducal family over there is going to be taking a lead on that front. Melchior's baptismal studies have been going pretty well, and Sylvester gives him a small present, his very own ring to give a blessing. Why? Well, because he needs to practice before his big day, <laughs> though Sylvester will be taking it back on the day of his baptism to give it to him at the ceremony. But when it comes to him actually returning a blessing, he's struggling. That's when Florencia steps in and pushes a bit of her mana into his hand, causing Melchior's to flow and push it out. The sensation is described not as gross, but uncomfortable. That makes his mana flow into his ring and he returns a blessing. Does he actually understand controlling his mana a bit better? Not really. But hey, it's a step. He brings up the story Wilfried told him about Rosemine's baptism and asks how much he needs to do all that. But Sylvester shoots him down and says don't try to compare himself to Rosemine. She's a special case after all. But I mean, that's kind of weird. Charlotte talks about her as a role model. Sylvester mentions Melchior seems to respect her quite a bit despite not really talking to her. They only ever see each other for a brief moment at dinner. And for Melchior, it's just sort of a matter of course. Charlotte visits him the most and tells him about how amazing Rosemine is, Wilfrey brings him toys Rosemine made, and even his parents compliment her recipes, so basically everyone's praising her. He also knows his role as supporting her and Wilfried as the future Archducal couple. He definitely wants to protect them, but Sylvester says it's way cooler to protect a bunch of people instead. He tells Melchior about Rosemine's shield during the attack, and he goes and grabs his picture bible to show him shoots Arya's shield in it. But Sylvester says Rosemine's was even bigger, and probably only she and Ferdinand could actually do it. Melchior immediately draws that connection to the temple and assumes it's an amazing place, and asks if he can go when he's baptized. That makes Sargarect worry, but Sylvester grants him permission. Why is that? Melchior will be taking over the role of High Bishop as soon as Rosemine comes of age. They plan on keeping that position filled by an Archduke candidate for as long as possible. But Florencia isn't really budging on him going later rather than sooner, because if he does go sooner, he'll probably just end up troubling Rosemine. So they agree he can go once he learns to control his mana, as well as all the prayers he'll need to know as the High Bishop. His retainers still aren't pleased, but Florencia asks them to open their minds a little since Rosemine has improved the temple quite a bit. So here was our first real look at Melchior, and we saw a few key aspects of his personality in this little intro. It's interesting that he's a character introduced through a perspective chapter rather than Rosemine's point of view, but he's clearly accustomed to holding her on a pedestal. But I think what stands out the most about him is how naively innocent he is in his wish to support her. That makes him immediately likable as a character. I will say the author does a pretty good job writing children, despite the main character being a literal adult inside a child's body. 
Back to Rosemine, she's in the teleporter room after just kidding back to Ironfest. The first person charging up to greet her is Bonifatius, of course, who just wants to praise her because she came first in class. Yet again. But he's stopped by her guard knights and car step. They're not having a repeat of last year where he damn near killed her by throwing her into the ceiling. So Rosemine offers a solution instead, offering to hold his hand while they walk to the northern building, that way she can tell him about her year. After parting ways with Bonifatius, it's not long before she goes to the tea room while her crap is being put away, that way she can have a meeting with Charlotte and Wilfried. Turns out Melchior's room was prepared while they were away. Wilfried is happy to just have some company on his floor since Rosemine's got Charlotte, and Rosemine remarks just how little she knows about him besides the brief moment she sees him at dinner when he wishes his parents good night. Though she does remember how much he reminds her of Florencia, even though his hair color is like Sylvester's, but she's gonna be blessing him at his baptism and she can't wait to meet him officially. At dinner, she's stuck breaking the bad news to Bonifatius that the apprentices asked her to give them the darkness blessing again, which pisses him off because they're essentially asking their Archduke candidate to commit a crime. While their dinner matches are improving, they clearly don't understand their role as knights because they failed to protect her again. So Bonifatius wants to go to the Inner Duchy tournament next year instead of Ferdinand, which Ferdinand actually agrees with? What the hell? And since he's not going, Rosemine's gonna have to stay locked in the dorm with Bonifatius. And even Sylvester points out that Ferdinand is contradicting himself from before the tournament, when he wanted her to participate as much as possible and gain experience. Rosemine thinks to herself how strange he's been acting since they bumped into the Sovereign Knight's commander. And just what the hell is an adult Gisa anyway? It's at this point we start to notice he's trying to avoid the Royal Academy, and why that is comes up later on in this book. His reasoning's pretty sound, but it does beg the question, why did he put himself on the royal's radar in the first place? <laughs> well, probably because Ferdinand just isn't that great at noble socializing either. They move on to Spring Prayer, where Sylvester couldn't find anything new and is having Ferdinand take a group of scholars to Haldenzell to witness the ritual and research the magic circle. Fuck it, let's brute force this bitch, right? Next, they're gonna summon the planting company to sell books in the playroom, and invitations for the mana compression class were already sent out. Awesome. But when it comes to selling intelligence, Ferdinand tells her to take Wilfried so it looks like he's involved. Basically, he spells it out for her. She stands out too much and they don't want others getting the wrong idea. She needs to prop him up as her future husband and Archduke. So the next day, she meets with Charlotte and Wilfried to organize the information they gathered and it's a pretty big task by their standards, <laughs> though Rosemine's fairly used to it. They're surprised she did all this on her own last year, especially while she was recovering. And that's a solid hint of how oblivious Wilfried is, since he really doesn't have a solid idea of what Rosemine is doing most of the time. But hey, he wants to be more involved. After that, they have the mana compression where Roderick learns it and Felina signs her countrywide contract finally. And then a meeting request comes in from his father since he hasn't come home yet. Sucks to be him. She refuses and decides to let Sylvester handle the issue. With that settled, Rosemine heads to the playroom to advertise the planting company's goods and also try to find some new retainers. Brunhilde has a suggestion since her sister would be a pretty good fit here. She's an arch noble, interested in trends, and studying to become an attendant like her sister. Awesome. And Judith throws in her brother as well because he's planning on becoming a knight next year. All right. In the playroom, they call over their siblings, and Brunhilde's sister, Bertilda, is a mini version of her big sister. She's super pleased to meet Rosemine and accepts the offer to become her retainer. <laughs> Though, uh, she still needs to train under Elvira and get passing marks. This was already decided, like, way before even speaking to Rosemine, so likely Bertilda would have been put on her radar in a year or so. Next to be introduced is a mature boy named Theodore, Judith's younger brother, and about to enter the academy next year. Judith is super eager to introduce him, but Theodore calms her down enough to do it himself. Angelica and Cornelius give him their seal of approval, having seen him train and all, which is a big deal since they're Bonifatius' surprise disciples, so he's pretty happy to hear that. But when Rosemine initiates the whole retainer thing, uh, he's a little less than thrilled. Why? Well, he can't. His plan is to serve Geep Kernberger as a guard knight like his father does. So a few bombs were just dropped here. It was mentioned last book that some nobles would serve Geebs, but Geebs have their own scholars and guard knights. As for attendance, we saw that way back in part 3's side story with Bridget, that she actually has an attendant. So yeah, Geebs have people in their service similar to Archdukes, but... I will say it seems that they're more in service of the province rather than the person. As we'll see next part, Geeb Kernberger is actually kind of an exception to that rule. 
People want to serve him specifically. Second, Judith made a huge faux pas here. She threw out her brother on a whim, but she never asked him for his intentions. We know for a fact that Cornelius, Bridget, Angelica, and even Traugott were all approached, while Hartmut put his name out there. Hell, Brunhilde talked trends with her sister and knew she wanted to join Rosemine's service. She was being trained for the role already. One has to be asked beforehand if they want to be a retainer, because otherwise you're just springing it on them and no good really comes of that, especially when status is taken into account. So now Theodore's in a pretty bad spot. He could simply be ordered to give up on his dream and be a retainer should Rosemine will it, but luckily she's not that kind of girl. Instead, she says she finds his dream admirable and wants to support him in it. However, she does still need a guard knight in the academy, and offers Theodore a compromise. Serve her just when she's in the academy and be free of her service upon graduation. I mean, this has some real benefits since he's gaining some experience, but that also means Keith Kernberger is getting a guard knight trained by the Archducal family, so that's an extra big perk. Yeah, he's gonna have to think it over. But Riard isn't pleased though. In private, she scolds both Judith and Rosemine. Judith for putting her brother in a situation like that, and Rosemine for blurting out whatever came to her mind again. The other kids all witnessed it too, so there's no going back now. Riard sends an ordinance off to Sylvester, and immediately Rosemine is called to his office for a talk. Ferdinand lays into her, saying this is a stupid idea, but she claps back, asking what happened to all of his retainers from when he was in school. Yeah, he's down to three and borrowed some guard knights for the tournament. She's got him there, and Sylvester confirms that by laughing and saying that she's doing exactly what Ferdinand did in the academy. He says their circumstances are different though, as his retainers were all of Lady Veronica's choosing and spies. Ferdinand doesn't really have an issue with Theodore as a candidate, just the whole him not being a full-time guard knight thing. I mean, she's not going to ruin his dream over this, and there's really no one else. Sylvester finds this the most amusing, as he grants permission, since it's better than her idea to share retainers with Melchior, but she can't treat him the same as her other guard knights, or else it just wouldn't be fair to them. Ferdinand says he has an issue with her current staff because on top of needing more apprentices, she also needs older adult women to serve her since she's staying in the duchy as the first wife. But they have time to find those. She needs to get through the academy first. With that, Sylvester talks to Gieb Kernberger, and he gives permission, with the condition that Kernberger is the next province to get printing after Lies Gang this year. Well, it seems to have worked out, but now Kernberger is on the horizon. And with some juicy lore, too. Rosemine schedules a meeting with the planting company before the book sale, where Charlotte, Wilfrey, Groeschel, and Haldenzell sit in so they can prepare for next year's printing boom at the academy. After Benno gets her siblings up to speed because this is their first time sitting in on a meeting like this, the topic comes down to commission for Benno for the other provinces. Transportation costs are an issue the two Gibes aren't too happy about. But Rosemine tells him she's currently working with a researcher in the academy to create less mana-intensive transportation circles to sort out their issue long term. Otherwise, they can just send their goods with their taxes or pay Benno to haul them by carriage. They compliment her foresight, and Wilfried is shocked to hear all this. Again, he doesn't really know what Rosemine's doing because he's not reading her reports, obviously, or showing much interest. After that, Rosemine says the nobles can leave so she can talk to Benno about some other business, but they wish to stay in here, so she's stuck with them, and tells Benno about them winning the rights to sell the Dunkelfelger book, and the Archduke Conference will set the terms in stone. This deal will serve as a foundation for future negotiations with other duchies for their book publishing rights. Gieb Haldenzell immediately starts thinking in terms of profits, not that she's gathering stories from other duchies. But Groeschel seems to lack a specialty here. Rosemine seems to print just about everything in her workshop, and Haldenzell handles the romance books. But what about his province? Good thing they're about to be swamped. So she asks him to handle Roderick's book called A Ditter Story, and night stories from across the country. Benno updates the Gutenberg's progress with the Groeschel Smiths, and they're all doing pretty well. So Groeschel's investment on that is starting to pay off. Also, uh, her mattress is ready. Hell yeah, so Zack will deliver it to her in the temple. Next, Benno mentions that they've learned a lot from Karin of Klausenberg, and hands over a report compiled of info from not just Klausenberg, but all the duchies Karin traveled through. And that surprises the nobles there, that she gathers intelligence from the lower city. But Wilfried says it's a good practice, as even he's learned a lot during spring prayer, just wandering around. He's motivated to work for the commoner's sake after getting thanks, and it reminds him why he needs to be a good archduke. Here, Gieb Haldenzell tells him that without commoners, nobles would suffer in turn. So as long as he understands the importance of commoners, he'll make a fine archduke. That's a bit of rare praise that hits Wilfried pretty hard. Wilfried is so used to being insulted by other nobles for his past mistakes and stupidity that hearing some genuine praise is honestly a pretty big boost for him. 
At the book sale, Rosemont gives Lamprecht a copy of Arnsbach's stories as a gift for Aurelia. That'll help pass her time while she's locked up in her room, right? And then we move on to the baptism. Well, before that though, she receives a letter of invitation from Charlotte and Wilfried so they can introduce her to Melchior officially. Rosemont's bumped because her one with Charlotte was where she learned just how cute her little sister was. Also, Wilfried ruined it, so hopefully that doesn't happen again. Well, probably not, since he's involved this time. So she goes that evening and meets Melchior. He gives her a greeting, saying his blessing because he doesn't have his ring with him, but he gets passing marks from his siblings. This does remind her of how Camille is doing, he's about five at this point. And Wilfrey notes something interesting as well. Rosemine and Melchior look like brother and sister because their hair matches. That's kind of cute. Either way, Rosemine is in love with Melchior's cuteness, and after chatting a bit, it turns out he's a bit anxious about his baptism. Charlotte tells him not to worry and just focus on Rosemine. That helped her from thinking about all the eyes on her. But Wilfried points out that she had a winter one, meaning there were other kids there with her, so Melchior's gonna be on his own, just like Wilfried was. So Rosemine breaks up that little spat by asking Melchior what he likes, and it turns out he likes the book she makes. And his favorite? The picture bible of all things. So she immediately tells Riarda to go fetch the High Bishop's Bible so she can read it to him, and she shoots that down. Ferdinand has told her not to take it out so willy-nilly, and definitely for good reason. Well, he'll just have to settle for being told the stories instead, and he's fine with that. After the party, they see Melchior off to his room, and Charlotte feels like her position as big sister was taken from her. While Wilfried remarks how Rosemine only dotes on younger siblings, and he wishes she'd show that sort of compassion towards him. But, uh, that's funny. According to Ferdinand, she's too soft on him as is. For the feast itself, it goes about as expected. She gets a face stone as an honor student again, along with quite a few others. Hell, Matthias even made it too. He's from the former Veronica faction. But Sylvester reports on the other happenings from the tournament, and we jump into the ceremony proper. Melchior enters, literally focusing on her the whole time, and we see he has darkness, water, fire, wind, and earth elements. Rosemine tells him to dedicate himself and earn even more blessings. And that's when Sylvester jumps up on stage and gives him a ring. Then Rosemine blesses him a bit too much, which Ferdinand silently scolds her for. But that's in the past. Melchior is now officially a noble of Arenfest. That said, he does get a bit sidelined by the plot in this volume and next. Melchior becomes a bit more involved in the story a few volumes into part 5. At dinner a bit later, Rosemine brings up a very important piece of business that Sylvester seems to have forgotten about fish. She's owed her damn seafood after all this time, and his ass is keeping her from it. So she asks if he'll teach her chefs, and maybe Aurelia should come too, since, you know, this was sort of for her. Now Karstad is fine with that. But that does mean they'll need more guards, and inviting all of Karstad's family as guests too. Florencia points out the key fact that maybe Aurelia isn't feeling well enough to attend without mentioning that whole being pregnant thing, but that really just means she needs to ask Lamprecht first. It's his wife, right? So she borrows him after dinner and hears that Aurelia is not handling her condition well. She's tired and keeps throwing up. So basically, if invited, she's gonna have to go because it's an invitation from the Archduke's family. Also, she'll have to remove her veil. Remember, she's trying to avoid that. Yeah, not a good situation for her. So Lamprecht asks them not to invite her. And Rosemine plans to throw some in a time-stopping magic tool so she can enjoy it later. Too bad for Cornelius, since he actually wanted some of that good food. The next day, Ferdinand brings the tool and bumps into Rosemine at the training grounds. Rosemine wants to see what fish Aurelia brought, but Ferdinand tells her to give it up. The tool's already in the kitchen, and he's just happy to not have to supply it with mana anymore. Remember, that tool takes a ton. Though now that we mention it, it's kinda rare to see Ferdinand at the training ground when he's usually working with the scholars. So, uh, it's kinda clear that his match at the academy left an impression. He's out of shape and needs to work on that. After her own training, she scribbles down some recipes for fish to give to her chefs later, and otherwise pumps herself up for more. Until dinner actually comes, and she's suddenly hit with a massive dose of reality. The first course is soup, as you would expect, and it's traditional. Yeah, traditional to Jürgen Schmidt's standards meaning they threw out the broth, so this is just water with floating chunks in it. That hasn't come up in a while. So yeah, Rosemine's pretty upset. But the main course does cheer her up. She takes a bite and it actually tastes like fish. So much so, she's about to tear up. So she asks for another helping. But uh, maybe they could do a salt grill with some citrus juice on it. Alright, the chef heard that order, so when it comes out, it's the same thing. Just with salt and citrus juice squeezed on it. Let me clarify, the first dish was like, pan-fried, so it's not what she ordered at all. Okay, maybe that was her bad, she had bad communication skills. 
Oh well, she'll just have to experiment when she gets back to the temple. Rosemine tells Lisa Letta to have the chefs put the remaining ingredients back in the time-stopping magic tool, and Ferdinand flashes her a dazzling smile when he asks her why she would do that. Well, he's pissed. Remember he wanted to be done supplying that damn thing? But she's gonna take this stuff to the temple and experiment for new recipes, so he's not gonna be able to stop her. The next day, she makes her panda bus to transport the magic tool, and yeah, it's not big enough. Mini van size won't cut it. She's gonna need her bus sized one because this thing is big enough for an adult to lay in comfortably. So would it be a bad time to remind people that they preserve dead archdukes and time-stopping magic tools? Pretty much just like this one? Back at the temple, she has Fran call Hugo and Ella, much to Roderick's surprise since nobles don't generally talk to servants, but she tells him to adapt to her methods quick, because this gets results and he will most likely become her most trusted retainer since he's given his name. When Hugo and Ella show up, they talk about cooking fish like it was a battle zone, because some would literally need thrown into pots to explode and crap. Well, that's just crazy. Some of the chefs even warned them to just throw them away, leaving them on some dry land somewhere until they died. Why? because these are too much for commoner chefs to handle. Good thing Ferdinand is a master at killing fade bees, so she can get her meat with his help. So she tells them not to throw anything away until she talks it over with him, and study the recipes they learned and incorporate their methods. When Zom gets back reporting to Ferdinand, he says he wishes to sit in on her meeting with the Gutenberg she's planning. He has some questions for them as well. Well, that kind of throws a wrench in her plan, she was going to have them come before she has to leave for spring prayer. There's really not much time until that happens. When the day of the meeting arrives, they pile into the noble meeting room, rather than the orphanage director's office, and she's presented with the chair that's using the spring technology like the mattress she ordered that's being delivered that day. She takes a seat, and it's not the most comfortable she's ever sat in, but hey, it's leagues above what's in this world. If she puts a cushion on it, it'd be pretty much perfect. So she decides to purchase it right then and there, and Ferdinand's annoyed this is the first time he's hearing about this new technology. Why didn't she tell him? She knows the rules by now. Well, because this was just a prototype, and Zack will be too busy with printing to spread mattresses. It's not really worth her bringing up yet, but he doesn't care and demands to try it himself, since it'll supposedly make beds and carriages more comfortable. And hey, he's impressed, enough so that he orders a bench for himself. That's gonna end up being used as a bed. With that, she orders some stuff from Benno, they discuss ramping up production for next year, gets updates on the Gutenberg's progress, where the main thing a note is Groschel Smith's put Danilo in his place and made him work his ass off to improve. And then they have the Gutenbergs start their preparations for Lies Gang. They request to stay in the lower city though, rather than the Gibbs estate, and she'll see what she can do about that. But now Ferdinand asks his question and he wants to know if there's a store in the lower city that sells face stones. Well, the craftspeople aren't too sure, and neither is Benno or Mark, but someone there does. Lutz asks for permission to speak, which is not normal at all, but Ferdinand permits it. He explains there's a store that buys face stones from accidental fey beast kills. He hasn't done it himself, but some commoners will kill shoemills and zanses for their meat and such, and when they screw up butchering them, they melt into face stones. We saw that in the first volume side story. Ferdinand finds that information useful, and we'll ask Gustav about it since the guild or the owner are the ones who are going to know the most about that business. So Rosemine changes the subject while he's lost in thought to Karin. Basically, she hasn't really tried to make contact with anyone, and Benno's impressed about her work and information gathering skills, though they'll be on guard when spring ends and the outside merchants swarm in. Rosemine thought they might be starbound, but Benno quickly dashes that rumor. If there is a single side story I would have liked to have seen in this series, it would be the one with Benno and Karin bickering. Benno hasn't really had a lot going on as a character since, like, part two, so this would have been a real shift for him. Too bad we don't get that, and he's shown zero interest in her. After Winter's coming of age, Rosemine pesters Ferdinand in earnest about dissecting her fish for cooking, and he's finally fed up enough to agree to a date. So two days from then, he'll do it. But she'll need her riding clothes and guards on hand. I mean, kinda sounds like she's about to go to war instead of cooking, but either way, she's getting a meal. After Lisa Letta brings her clothes, she waits in her workshop until Ferdinand shows up with Eckhart. Judith guards her during the process, while Ferdinand has the knights take a defensive position, and he pulls a fish out, throwing it into the circle of knights, and they're using shields to encircle it. Why? Because it turns out this thing is like a puffer fish that shoots out poisonous barbs, and they have to wait it out until it's finally out of ammo. But the problem is, some are flying back into the fish, making Rosemine upset, because is it even going to be edible at that point? Who knows? Probably not. So when it's all said and done, Ferdinand hands her the barbs and says they're valuable ingredients. But that's really not the point here. She doesn't want brewing ingredients, she wants cooking ingredients. 
Her chefs can't really make this into food. But Ferdinand isn't a butcher himself, he only knows how to harvest for brewing. So they decide to kill the next one without damaging it enough to turn it into a face stone. Ferdinand pulls out two and has Eckhart hold one, while Rosemine pumps it full of mana. Its scales glow rainbow colors before swelling into round stones. And then she has to peel them off. Hey, these are pretty. It might even make for a nice piece of jewelry. Or not. Everyone's looking at her in disbelief since these are rainbow face stones filled with her mana. Meaning they're highly valuable ingredients. Oh well, maybe later. She gives one to each of the knights as payment for their help, and even Judith. But she's confused by that. Judith didn't even do anything, right? Well remember, Bonifati has just got done scolding them about awarding points. She was doing a key support role here, protecting Rosemine, so she gets a reward. After that, she tries to flay a Japanese style, but Ferdinand yells at her because that would kill it outright and turn it into a face stone. So Ferdinand and Angelica gracefully cut off the edible pieces. And that's that. Next is the exploding one, and they throw that into a pot with other chunks of fish. The knights have to hold the lid on until it's done exploding, and then it's basically fish paste at the end. She'll find a use for that. Yeah, commoners couldn't handle this sort of prep work on their own. With that, Rosemine has her ingredients, and Hugo and Ella prepare dinner her way. That night, while she and Ferdinand are eating, she remarks how awesome fish is, and she's come to want Arnsbach. Yeah, what a very noble thing to say. Because Ferdinand damn near spits out his food just hearing it. I mean, she just meant the cuisine, but he didn't get that at all. Her salt grilled fish is served, and Ferdinand says it smells agreeable. That's code, if you'll recall, for a noble saying hand over your plate and they'll eat their fill first. At least if they outrank you. Rosemine remembers that from her spring prayer with Sylvester, before brushing off the request by remarking that she'll only give him half. Ferdinand hits back saying she knows what the proper etiquette here is if she remembers that line. But she sticks to her guns, because she's been waiting for this for a while, giving him half after she's done, which he's choosing to interpret as her being of higher status than him in the temple, which is true. He ends the meal saying that her guard knights need to be careful in Lies Gang, since they'll be treated well, but he's not too sure about Wilfried. So this is our third trip to Lies Gang overall, and Rosemine's really not spent any time there aside from the side building. So yeah, this is going to be a lot different than her last few trips. Also, her guards are a lot more on alert this time, since, you know, they were attacked twice. Well, once and the second time failed. Brushing over Spring Prayer itself, where the only real takeaways is Hartmut wanted to learn tax work so he could be Rosemine's scholar for the Harvest Festival. And from Gunther, we hear that the orphanage kids are playing with Camille. So Conrad, Dirk, and him are friends. Ferdinand and Rosemine leave at the same time, with him going to Haldenzell for research while she goes on to Lies Gang with some select retainers, Leonor, Hartmut, Brunhilde, and Cornelius. Also, Karstet and Elvira are coming along with the Detach of the Knight's Order to protect all the Archduke candidates traveling. Felina and Roderick had a chance to opt out of this, but they're coming along because they're putting their work over their feelings, knowing they'll both probably be mistreated. Well, good on them. Sylvester gives her one last warning before they leave to shield Wilfried, because this kid's got this blind optimism that's gonna cause friction with the Lies Gangs, and she says she will. Ferdinand tells Wilfried not to lower his guard either, but he says things went fine when he did his initial check, so he's not really worried. But Ferdinand tells him of course they had to go fine, or else it would reflect poorly on Lies Gang. They're not going to show him any weakness. So Wilfred needs to remember he's going to be in enemy territory here because these people want Rosemine to be the next off. She tries to cheer him up a bit, saying Ferdinand might sound harsh, but the fact that he's giving him these warnings means that he cares. And so they head off. In Lies Gang, she hands off the chalices to the Geeb and is taking the Gutenbergs down to the near settlement of Fluss. It's very similar to the farming towns in the central district, so... No walls are underground. Lies Gang is primarily a farming province with very high yields in Ehrenfest, so essentially it feeds the entire duchy. When Veronica was in power, they received less mana through their chalices, so they had to make up for that with their own. So basically, it put them through hell. That's one of the many reasons why they're bitter towards all the Arnsbach blood in the Archducal family. Down in Fluss, Brunhilde was taken as well so she could gain some experience with other provinces. And she's actually relishing in the challenge this time so she can take what she learns back to Groschel. It finds Fluss much more agreeable in terms of smell. Probably because the commoners aren't all packed in together with no air circulation like Ehrenfest or Groschel. Brunhilde asks Leonore if she knew it was like this, and she did. She actually left the noble section of Lies Gang before to hunt Fey Beast before joining Rosemine's service, so she's got experience outside city walls. Wilfried guides them to the workshop and explains that printing will be winter handiwork in Lies Gang, mostly done by women and children, which impresses Rosemine that he's learned all that, 
but he does put his scholars to use for some things, at least relating to work, so they introduce the Gutenbergs and head on back to the mansion. In the meeting with Benno, the contracts are all signed without much issue, but Benno does feel the need to interject, despite his low status. He's worried the Gieb won't make any money, and he says it's none of his concern. They won't cancel the contracts because money isn't what they're after with printing. Okay, good enough for Benno. So he leaves and then it's just the nobles. Now the real discussion can actually begin. Guy Bleisgang looks straight on at Rosemine herself and asks to hear it from her rather than a messenger. Leonor tries to step in and stop it, but he brushes her off. Okay, so we've known for a while that Leonor is a Lysgang noble and that she's from the province itself, but here's where we actually get her familial connection to the family. She's the Gieb's niece, so fairly closely related. So Rosemine lays it out after deciphering the euphemism correctly that she's not interested in being Ob. She loves books way too much. He's in disbelief over how crazy her book obsession is, even after hearing that she didn't want the seat of Ob from his niece, half-nephew Hartmut, distant relative Brunhilde, they all told him the same thing. But why? It frustrates him how ill-equipped Wilfried is for the role, and now she won't go for it herself? What the hell? Mind you, Wilfried is sitting right there, but she props him up, saying how hard he's working for Aaronfest by visiting the towns for spring prayer. The problem is that goes for her too, but all she wants is books and new paper, not power. So everyone sort of laughs at how dire Aaronfest would be under Rosemine, who only wants books. Wilfried asks the Gee for help in keeping Rosemine contained, but he's too far from the city to really be of any assistance. Or at least that's the logic he's using to back out, considering he was trying to push her for Aub a second ago. He lays it out on the table at this point that the grudge of Lysgang, the one that's been going on for so long, would have died with his grandfather. Lysgang has always supported the duchy, even before it was Aaronfest. And after the previous Gieb finally died, the current one was willing to kiss Veronica's ring, so to speak, and fall in line to end their poor treatment. The issue is... Rosemine exists. Her appearing when she did, being adopted right as Veronica fell from power, and bringing the duchy so much prosperity on top of that, essentially revitalized the grudge of the old man and had him rally the older Lysgang nobles under him. That slowed when she went into her long sleep, but then she woke back up right before the academy. Really, she's a blessing and a curse depending on who you ask. The previous Gieb's fall from grace is the reason Arnsbach hostilities run so deep in Ironfest. But if they can talk to him and calm his hatred, then perhaps they could finally unite behind Wilfried and put these faction politics to rest. Well, that's a tall order, and Wilfried says all he can really do is talk to him. But before they end it there, Rosemine asks about their stage. Theirs was lost. Not destroyed, mind you, but actually lost. The mansion has changed locations a few times in their history, and they legit just don't know where the original was. But hey, they don't even really need it since the snow melts so early there. It's the northern provinces that really want it badly, so anybody to the middle or south wouldn't see too much more benefit. So now we're finally getting the bookend to all this Arnsbach drama. We've heard a ton about the history, even on both sides. But here's the actual grudge that's keeping the whole thing going. So let's see how they handle the previous Gieb Lies gang. So the time comes to meet with her great-grandfather and she has a sudden realization. Herself, Brunhilde, Hartmut, Leonor, and Cornelius all have the same great-grandfather. Well, that was sort of why she brought them there in the first place, but Cornelius points out that pretty much all nobles are related anyway, so Wilfried and Charlotte also have Lies gang blood, even if their great-grandfather doesn't want to admit it. So they head out and meet up with Charlotte and Wilfried. They're not really too sure how to convince the old man, and hope that Rosemine does, but hell if she knows. All she can really do is deliver the news herself that she's not seeking the seat of Archduke. And with that, they head off to their meeting. So he greets them all with open arms. Well, Rosemine because he's not even looking at Charlotte and Wilfried. As they take a seat, they try to broach the subject, but he's not really having any of it. He plays dumb, ignores Wilfried and Charlotte more, and uses his age and health as an excuse to turn a blind eye, to the point Rosemine has to flat out say she's not looking to be Archduke. He fake, or maybe real, who knows, collapses and his attendant gets him to bed. That's shocking, but they tell them to wait it out because he'll be back up in a second. Charlotte's visibly disturbed, and Rosemine's not taking it too well herself. But Wilfried and her attendants? Yeah, this is a Tuesday to them, so they barely react at all. Sure enough, he does get back up, and they jump right into the conversation. With this farce going on long enough, Rosemine throws out that their engagement is approved of by the king. Does he really plan to go against the king's wishes? Of course not, but he just has his concerns. Wilfried steps up like a man for once, and says he'll end the Lies Gang struggle with Rosemine as his first wife. 
For the first time, the previous Gieb drops the act and stares right into Wilfried with emotionless eyes. He then asks what he'll do if a greater duchy tries to force a marriage into Arenfest. So Wilfried counters, saying that if he finds himself in the same boat as the first Gieb Groschel, his father plans to adopt his children before the wife comes, securing their place as Archduke candidates. With that, the previous Gieb closes his eyes and remarks that the AUB has resolved too then. After it's quiet for some time, they call it there. They leave, and on the way out, Rosemine swears that she saw her great-grandfather crying. Well, I'm glad that's over. Right? Well, I mean, it feels over if you just ignore the fact they didn't actually come to a resolution and just assume they won him over. That probably won't come up again. Time for an Archduke Conference pregame meeting. They had a meeting with the merchants in the Italian restaurant and decided they only had 20 slots they could take comfortably this year, and Rosemine's reporting that to Sylvester. How can they swing that with so much interest? Well, that's his job to figure out because they can't house anymore. They have publishing rights to discuss with Dunkelfelger, so they're going to need slots for them somehow, which is where Rosemine throws out punishing Klausenberg for leaving a merchant behind in their lower city. So drop some of their slots so Dunkelfelger and Klausenberg both have six. That way the sovereignty can keep their eight, so they're not disrespecting rank here. To tide people over, they can always sell the production method of Rinsham, since Druanchel was pretty close to cracking the recipe anyway. They also expect Charlotte to receive a ton of marriage proposals this year, so things are definitely going to be hectic. Not that Sylvester's pleased to hear that. So the group all head out, and Hartmut's with them, because he's an adult now, and he can represent Rosemine's interest as her retainer. That leaves her, Ferdinand, Bonifatius, and her siblings to hold down the fort. And Ferdinand isn't giving her any breaks, since she's taking the scholar course on top of the Archduke candidate course next year. So yeah, he's gonna make her study non-stop. She's not too worried about the scholar course though, since she has all the written lessons down from their study guides. But the Archduke candidate course is said to be pretty rough, and there's no study guides for it. But hey, that's what Ferdinand's there for. And Wilfried and Charlotte want to join in as well. Melchior too, but he's too young. Instead, he'll just watch and have study material on his level. This is all for Rosemine. If she knows something, he's not going to give a refresher for Charlotte and Wilfried. That's rough. But this does bring up the question, who teaches this class? Well, it was a royal when Ferdinand attended, or a former Archduke candidate married to a royal. But since they're so low on members, he really has no idea who's teaching it now. That's a surprise for part five. So they begin by kicking out all the retainers. Yes, all of them. This is coursework that's a highly guarded secret, and no one can know unless they're an Archduke candidate. That's how it goes in the classes themselves, too. He gives them some face stones to start, and the task is simple. Separate the elements inside. Every third year learns to do this, but it's easier to manipulate the more elements you have, but also harder to sort out the mixed man inside. They need to know this before they even begin their lessons on the Archduke candidate classes. Why is this important? Well, you can fill an empty face stone with a single element this way, or hell, even replace an element entirely. So it's pretty damn useful. After repeated failures on all three of their parts and Wilfried and Charlotte tapping out, Rosemine gives it one final push and pictures a centrifuge, even doing a weird motion with her hand that makes Ferdinand groan. But it proved effective since she passed. Hooray. The next day, they're going to be making a model room with Envenkeln, but they need blueprints first. This makes Rosemine imagine her perfect room, which is basically her old library from Japan. Too bad it killed her during an earthquake, and that flashback alone makes her somewhat depressed. So when she's not done, Ferdinand tasks her to have him finish by tomorrow. That way they can move on. But that night at dinner, he gets an urgent summons to the Royal Academy. That's serious, since he wasn't summoned last year with all the shit popping off. Now Rosemine's worried, because he made the same face he did in the library when talking with Raublut. But Ferdinand is back the next day, so he wasn't gone too long, I guess. She asks what that was about, and he says it was nothing. The matter is settled. Melchior's a little scared from his intensity, but hell. Even at lunch, Bonifatius asks Ferdinand to spit it out, because he's clearly not over whatever crap happened. So he says that Arnsbach petitioned for a male Archduke candidate to be married into their duchy. And since he was summoned, that means Arenfest is the one being petitioned, which just leaves Ferdinand, honestly. So he's gonna be marrying Detlind? Oh hell no. Ferdinand shot them down with plenty of valid excuses to prevent the marriage. However, it seems they assumed that he was being mistreated by serving in the temple against his will. He's not, though. So, that's why it's over. Or not. He was summoned again, but this time he didn't come back. That sort of puts a damper on Rosemine's plans to cram her practical lessons in when she finally had the chance. Now she's stuck doing normal girl things that she absolutely hates, like practicing sewing. Yuck. So she begs Riarda to let Bonifatius teach her instead. But he's busy with the whole managing the duchy while Sylvester's gone thing. 
Probably not gonna happen. At dinner, though, she offers to help him out with the paperwork. That's a godsend. Hell, Wilfried, Charlotte, and Melchior all want to help, too. Not that Melchior can, but he has scholars in his service. They can work. They pile into a meeting room since the office isn't big enough for everyone, and Rosemind's the one breaking down the workload. She takes the most, Wilfrey takes the next load. Charlotte entertains Melchior by helping him study, while their scholars take their share of the work. You know, Bonifatius seems really willing to train people, especially in the Archducal family. Why that is isn't really explained for a few more books, but it's also not really spoilers, so I don't mind going ahead and saying it. He promised his father that he would help train members of the Archducal family because he didn't take the seat himself, despite his father wanting him to. Remember that Bonifatius was not overlooked for the seat, he chose not to take it. He's actually really competent. Work continues for a few more days, and they sit to have a break on one such occasion. There they chat about how crazy skilled Rosemine's retainers all are. Not just her scholars, but even her knights are handling paperwork because of their time in the temple. Yeah, Wilfrey can't compare, but his knights all beg him not to throw paperwork onto their job descriptions. Rosemine offers to throw more printing work his way since they could use the help, and he's motivated because then his adult retainers could attend the Archduke conference next year like Hartmut is. On another day, Matthias comes up as a topic of discussion because he's kind of impressive, but Bonifatius doesn't like it. Not him as a knight though, but she can't take him as a retainer unless he offers his name. Why? Well, he's Guy Gerlach's son, and if you'll recall, Bonifatius is very suspicious of him, and we as the audience already know he's after Rosemine. Damiel gets some praise here too, where Bonifatius says he's lucky his growth period lasted so long, and that Rosemine's mana compression method is really effective. Then we get a confirmation that his growth period is finally over. Now he just needs to hone his technique. We get a few cute moments where Riarda teases Bonifatius when their school days come up, and overall it's a pretty chill time. That is until word comes that the Archducal couple has finally returned. No shit. Time for a report on what happened. They race off to the teleporter room where Sylvester is seriously not happy. In fact, uh, he's straight up pissed off. They step off the teleporter when Ferdinand comes next. Rosemine greets him and he's wearing his dazzlingly fake smile. Yeah, that's definitely not good. Hartmut doesn't know the details either since he was busy with the Dunkelfugger negotiations. He only heard Sylvester shouting at Ferdinand in the dorm, something about a royal decree that can't be refused. But as for how things went with printing, it panned out how they expected. Though Dunkelfelger's first wife is pretty scary, since she deduced the existence of printing simply by looking at the book Hannah Laura borrowed. Don't underestimate a greater duchy. Other than that, Clarissa's parents had their eyes on Hartmut, her massive shield was a big topic of discussion, and Hartmut fanned the flames like he probably shouldn't have. Sylvester calls a meeting the next day for the usual report on what happened. Ferdinand still has that smile on, and Wilfried and Charlotte say he looks like he's in a pretty good mood. Rosemine knows better though, and says he only makes that face when he's extremely displeased. But as things start, the biggest news is their rank increased again. They're now the 8th ranked duchy. But Wilfried thought their rank would be even higher. I mean, probably not though, since those above them are now middle and greater duchies who fiercely supported the king. They're gonna need more than trends and grades to move up more. And that's straight up ignoring how little loyalty they've actually shown towards the current king. Other than that, everything else is basically as predicted. They're going with hers and Benno's suggestions for the business slots, the publishing rights were secured, and Ferdinand received his prize for the match. Charlotte got a ton of marriage proposals from greater duchies to be their second or third wife, while some of the higher ranked middle duchies wanted her as their first. They don't have to give their answers just yet, so they have time to decide who they want to forge alliances with. But she wasn't the only one receiving proposals. Some duchies offered Sylvester second or third wives as well. He's not too happy about that, but Florencia actually expects it. Hell, it's kinda selfish for political stability at this point. Next, Tildebrand debuted, Eglantine and Anastasius had their starbind, Aaronfest will get more hairpin orders for sure because of the advertising. Oh, and uh, one last piece of business. The king has ordered that Ferdinand's gonna marry Detlind after she graduates. Settled indeed. Well, some nobles are congratulating him and rejoicing that Arnsbach relations will resume, but those close to Ferdinand aren't super happy for obvious reasons. Rosemine's hit the hardest, since she wants to cry for him being forced to go to a duchy he hates to marry an arrogant brat who looks like the woman who tormented him for most of his life. Yeah, it's really not fair. They're rushing this engagement too, since as soon as Detlin graduates, they're sending Ferdinand to Arnsbach and marrying him that spring at the Archduke Conference. Usually the period for a marriage is like a year. What the hell? So this means they're gonna need a high priest. Who wants the job? Well, all the nobles are looking pretty reluctant. Except Hartmut, of course. He asks for it right away. Except, isn't he engaged too? Um, yeah, he is. 
priest can't get married. Not that he cares. He'll just write a letter explaining it, and if Clarissa wants to cancel, she can. All he wants to do in his life is help Rosemine. Besides, he's not leaving the nobility like Ferdinand did. He's resigning as soon as Rosemine graduates. So the deed is done. Hartmut is assigned as the new high priest with summer and fall to get him up to speed. But after the meeting, she's snatched away by Sylvester for the usual more private discussion. Well, at least this time she's not getting yelled at. Right? So Sylvester clears the room immediately, and Rosemine tries to escape this heated discussion until Ferdinand stops her. She's probably going to be asking the exact same question, so he doesn't want to waste his breath. With that, Sylvester wants to hear what happened when the king summoned him, since he wasn't in on that discussion. Wow, really? They didn't even have the ob in the loop? He didn't know Arnsbach was planning to weasel marriage into this when he sent Ferdinand off. Well, the reason he accepted that order is because he knew Sylvester would have fought it, and that would have put the duchy itself at risk. If it's an order from the king, you obey without question. That's Ehrenfest's main problem right now. They're shooting up the rankings without assisting the king, and their loyalty is uncertain. While Arnsbach fought in the Civil War, won, and is ravaged by a severe mana shortage with no Archduke candidates. They literally saw this themselves when they went to the border for the marriage last year. Remember that whole thing of greater value that Ferdinand alluded to them wanting? Turns out it was him. Why? Because they need someone with his specific skill set, mana rich, great administrative skills, and a person who has a track record of being a great teacher. <laughs> Though, uh, his temple connection is a bit of a problem. Not for him necessarily, but more for Sylvester. Yeah, rumors are flying around that Sylvester sends his non blood relatives to the temple and abuses them. Not a good look. And all these pleas to save Ferdinand came from Dunkelfelger and Juanchel, of course. But Sylvester knows there's a reason for all of this, and Ferdinand wouldn't have blindly accepted unless he knew it, and it was damaging to him. Well, he heard from an unverified source that Eustace has that Ob Arnsbach is on death's door, but that's not really his concern. No, he's worried who takes control after he's gone. Detlind is still underage, and per the law of the country, the first wife takes control until a new Ob is selected. Ferdinand plans to go there, gather information, and control Georgine as best he can. So great it benefits Ehrenfest. But that's not what Rosemine cares about. She asks Ferdinand if this is what he wants, and he tries to brush her off, but she's not buying it. He claps back, saying that this is what she wanted too, to get Arnsbach, remember? That's not what she meant when she said that, and he drops the act enough to say that he doesn't want the marriage itself, but it's useful to his goals, so he asks that she understand. With that, Ferdinand retreats to the temple with Rosemine to sort out his successors. On the way out, though, he tells Sylvester he needs to take a second or third wife as well. That'll get them stronger ties to higher-ranking duchies. Ehrenfest needs to step on to the country-wide political stage. Outside, though, Rosemine demands an extra private meeting because she's not satisfied with his answers just yet. And she name-drops Adelgisa to get him to agree. Wow, talk about a massive bombshell that's been building since the middle of this part. And yeah, Ferdinand's attitude towards the royal family finally came back to bite him in the ass. Getting back to the temple wasn't so simple, however, since the Veronica faction suddenly spammed Ferdinand with tea party invites since he's marrying into Arnsbach now. But when they are back, Rosemine pushes Ferdinand into his hidden room for a private chat. That's extremely sus since they're both now engaged, but she doesn't care. Her first question isn't about Adelgisa, surprisingly enough, but actually about Arnsbach's internal affairs. <laughs> like, couldn't Eustace be wrong here? Well, chances are no. The thought is, Letizia has a strong faction backing, being the first wife's granddaughter and adopted daughter, but things are pretty precarious. She's been adopted and is currently going to be marrying Hildebrand per the last conference. Yeah, Hildebrand is going to be marrying into Arnsbach, so he's not going to remain a royal for the rest of his life. However, we know that Arnsbach Law says that when a new Ob takes the seat, their siblings are demoted down to Arch Noble. If Detlin becomes the Ob, Letizia would be demoted down to Arch Noble herself. And that would probably really piss off Druanchel. Besides, it's also against the current Ob's wishes. So how are they going to remedy this? Upon his and Detlin's marriage, they're going to adopt Letizia. Detlin will become the next Archduke temporarily, and Ferdinand's real job here is to be Letizia's teacher, so she can learn to rule the duchy properly. Unfortunately, Detlin needs that training more, so Ferdinand's first job there is going to be getting her up to speed, and then focusing on Letizia. Yeah, Arnsbach's shitty political situation has finally come home to roost. But why Ferdinand and Ehrenfest of all things? Well, think about it. Ehrenfest's loyalty is being tested, as well as Ferdinand's. They've gone and made a huge mess of things with Rosemine's involvement, or at least that's being blamed for it. They were neutral during the Civil War, are now suddenly shooting up in the rankings, but also they screwed over the whole Eglantine marriage plot to select the next king and form a strong connection with Klausenberg. 
So yeah. And then they were at the center of that whole Bible business, driving even more wedges between the royals and the temple. Now, this isn't all their fault, but they are a convenient scapegoat. And Rosemine realizes she's at the center of just about all of these issues. However, don't look too far into that. They don't believe Rosemine's the real deal. Rather that she's just Ferdinand's puppet in some plot they couldn't even fathom. Which is where that whole Seed of Adel Gisa business comes in. Last book we got all that cape lore, and I know this is a bit less exciting, but... We're finally getting some Ferdinand lore. Rosemine assumes it's a place in the sovereignty based on how Ferdinand answered the knight's commander, and she's half right. And Olgisa is the name of a long dead princess gifted a villa in the sovereignty, a foreign princess, specifically from Lanzanov, the country Jurgen Schmidt imports their sugar from. The villa receives a new princess every generation or so, and archdukes from around the country visit to receive flowers. Not for pleasure, but for kids. The girls stay in Jürgenschmidt as princesses, while the first male is sent back to Lanzanov. The rest of the boys? They're all killed before their baptism, assuming they're not adopted. And if you recall back in part two with Dirk, males are much less likely to be adopted, or in this case, claimed. Ferdinand, however, was. His mother was the princess there, while his father was the previous Ob Ehrenfest. But he was baptized in Ehrenfest, so therefore he isn't a royal himself. He just happens to have relatively thick royal blood. So I guess the real question is, why was he taken if it's so unlikely to happen? Well, the goddess of time's guidance, of course, or so he was told. Seems far-fetched, but Rosemine buys it. After all, she's seen the gods do a ton in this world. <laughs> why wouldn't the goddess of time's guidance be a factor? So what does all this have to do with Ferdinand's new marriage? Well, he's a serious threat, having royal blood and using a saint to search for the Grutcher site. Or so they think. He's been told to prove his loyalty, and he had two options. Kill Sylvester and become Ob so he can't become king, or marry Det Lind. Rosemine tries to say he could have talked this over with Sylvester and worked it out, but no, the king wouldn't have allowed that, and Ferdinand made a promise to his father on his deathbed to protect Ehrenfest. So that's what he's doing. Yeah, his life is honestly pretty sad, enough so that Rosemine breaks down into tears and cries for him. Since he obviously won't, he offers her a hug for comfort, but really that just kicks her into gear. And she vows to come save him if he ever needs her help, and makes him promise not to give up and live a life of suffering. And that throws him off because what the hell is she even saying? Obviously he would suffer if it was for Ehrenfest, but Rosemine plows right through his logic with her own. She tells him that he's family to her, even though he can't believe that. I mean, he's the one who ripped her from her lower city family. Why would she ever think of him like that? Her man is getting out of control and he slams a face stone to her head to drain it, but she doesn't back down. If it came down to it, she'd even steal the Grutcher site and become queen herself just to save him. He's shocked by her resolve, but remembers that she can't stand knowing that people are suffering close by from when she saved the orphans. Well, I guess he really doesn't have a choice. He has to accept her conditions. As we can see, Ferdinand didn't really have an easy out of this situation without putting those he cares about at risk. And all that goading of his and Rosemine's actions really painted a different picture for the royal family. Honestly, I'd say they kind of got off easy. With that, they have a ton to sort out at the temple. Rosemine steps out to find Angelica talking to Eckhart. She's canceling their engagement here because she's Rosemine's guard knight. Now, it would have been acceptable for her to go to Arensbach with Eckhart, but she just doesn't want to. Hell, she's even hoping this can be used to postpone her next engagement for as long as possible. But as it turns out, Ferdinand is taking Eustace and Eckhart with him. Wait a minute, how is that possible when Eustace is a scholar? Don't they usually not let scholars go because they could be used as spies? Well, he's actually an attendant who does scholar work for fun. Ferdinand informs his temple attendants that he'll be leaving and they're not really surprised. Likely because Hartmut already told them. And with that, everyone gets to their usual paperwork. Well, with a few changes down the line at least. All this temple paperwork is going to be shifted down to the Blue Priest, with the High Bishop taking more of a ceremonial role, supplying mana, and managing the priests. That's to clear the way for Melchior and the High Priest who will support him. Since Hartmut is keeping up with the noble lifestyle and Ferdinand can't take his crap with him, or really just won't, Hartmut is just going to use his stuff in his temple attendance. And with that, the fealty ceremony is due to take place that day. Once the altar is all set up, her attendants remark how amazing the divine instruments look, and say it's no wonder Rosemine can make them with her stop. But uh, she actually can't make all of them. She doesn't know the chant for the goddess of light's crown. 
When Ferdinand arrives, he walks Rosemine through her role, since this is her first time doing one, and Hartmut repeats the prayer after her. With that, he's officially a priest, and is changed into his blue robes. He and Ferdinand hammer out the details of the handover process, where Ferdinand will act as the high priest for the summer ceremonies, giving Hartmut a chance to observe, and then they'll switch places in fall. After that, they have an introduction ceremony for the blue priest, like Rosemine had when she took over as high bishop, and this is so they can be introduced to Hartmut in an official capacity. The former Bezewant's loyals realize just how screwed they are and how that Rosemine's retainer is replacing Ferdinand, Especially after Hartmut flat out says he's there to ensure no one burdens the Saint of Arenfest. He did a similar intro in the orphanage, but there it was received a lot more positively. Are you ready for Hartmut shenanigans? Because they really ramp up from this book on. This is where he really dives off the deep end into Rosemine mania, so buckle up. Now they summon the lower city merchants to talk things over. They explain the decisions from the Archduke Conference, which makes the merchants happy since they didn't overbook their slots. The extra chefs from Frida were helpful, and it turns out Oto's craftswomen are improving enough they can make orders for nobles now. Not that they can compare to Tuli yet, but it's progress. Now Ferdinand announces his engagement, and the lower city people immediately pick up on the implications. Benno breaks the ice by bringing up the Bindewald incident, and worries if Rosemine's gonna be targeted again. But Ferdinand says he's planning on disposing as many dangerous elements in the duchy as possible before he departs. But he does ask that they take care of her from their end, by keeping track of suspicious people entering the duchy and such. With Ferdinand leaving, that brings the total people who know about her past to just Daniel in her day-to-day -day life. I mean, Sylvester and Karstad now, but... Daniel's really her closest confidant now. Oto asks if Ferdinand's gonna need a hairpin for his future wife, and he's not pleased about being reminded of it. He says if she wants one, he'll order it, but he's not planning on placing an order before then. Rosemine tells him how much Detland was looking forward to a hairpin when their meeting is over, but he's still not interested. The reason why he should is practical, though, as it would make his treatment in Arnsbach better. Well, if she's thinking that far ahead, why not pick one out for him since she's his family, right? That's not what she meant when she said that, though, and he's perfectly capable of doing so himself. Fret not, though. He's getting her one, too, as a farewell gift, since she's leaving his care. Now she's sad, but she'll make sure he has enough food from home as well. But he picks up on, that means she just wants him to send fish in return. But that's still not all. She wants to give him a sound recording magic tool with a message to remind him to eat and stop working so much. Sorry, Rymund. Looks like your list of crap to make Rosemine just keeps growing. Yeah, enough screwing around. She has brewing to accomplish. Specifically, Ferdinand is teaching her how to make the last of his special brand of potions. These things are stupidly expensive to make with rare ingredients, so he makes sure that Cornelius knows what they have. That way he can go out and get the ingredients for her. From there, Ferdinand has them all stashed away with what should be a five-year supply. He then dumps the rest of his brewing ingredients off on her and teaches Hartmut how to administer doses of potions for her. While he's teaching him, though, he drops some face stones in front of her and tells her to remove the foreign mana from them. She's probably going to start sensing mana soon, so she needs to practice a bit by feeling the mana inside ingredients and clearing out what doesn't belong. And when she passes that test, he throws down the ingredients he won through Ditter. Why is that? Because these are going to be the ingredients for her second Jareev. Ferdinand threw in the dust for that express purpose. But the other three will also work fine in a pinch. The issue is, they don't have a year to go running around to make one. Hell, they don't even have time for this discussion. Because when she's done brewing all this crap, they have to cram the entire Scholar and Archduke course into her head before the next year. Her grades can't slip, otherwise she'll look bad and his methods will be called into question. Okay, so she gets to brewing while Ferdinand attends to other business, with her guards overseeing this process. Cornelius is impressed she can make a Jareev already, since they didn't learn until their fifth year. Damiel wasted his entire school life on his, and now his mana capacity is beyond the ingredients he chose. That sucks. The ones made in the academy are much more of a proof of concept anyway, since they're low in quality. Hell, scholars in attendance have to pay knights to gather the ingredients for them, so theirs are even lower still. But I guess the real question is, when does she expect to use this? Probably after Ferdinand leaves, since the Dutch will be safe, right? Not that she really wants to go back in, because the last time she skipped ahead two years. Anyway, she finishes without issue, and calls Ferdinand in. And when he shows up, he drops the bombshell that she's gonna be jumping in right away. What the hell? No she's not, she doesn't want to. He explains this is all part of his preparations, so he can ensure that she's healthy by the time he leaves. If they wait until he's gone for Arnsbach, he won't be her doctor anymore. Well, how long are they expecting her to be out for this time? Only four days. Understand, she was on death's door last time, and this time she only needs the last of her mana clumps dissolved. 
Cornelius urges her to do it too because they're worried about her. And with that, she accepts. She's anxious as hell when she drinks and goes inside, but soon enough, she passes out. The next thing she knows, she's waking up with Ferdinand by her side. How long has it been? Four days, as predicted. He gives her one more check, and sure enough, her mana clumps are actually dissolved. Fran takes her to a bath, and she's going to be resting until tomorrow, but from now on, she should collapse a lot less often. Holy shit, it took 20 volumes for our girl to finally not be a second away from death on any given day. This is amazing. So she continues her studies, where the Archduke course is her main focus. She practices Entwin Keln and succeeds in making a box garden with a border gate, though it does crumble after some time, because little known secret, she's not using the correct names of the Goddess of Light and God of Darkness. That'll come up in part 5. But we get a bit more on what a foundational tool looks like. They're massive with a ton of circles and use face stones of every element. But the main takeaway of these scenes is just how close Rosamine and Ferdinand have gotten. Since she told him they're like family, he's much warmer to her. And while that's sweet, it could definitely cause problems later on. Oh well. Time for Hartmut's first ceremony, he's wearing some borrowed robes for it, since they have a ton of ceremonial robes laying in storage. But inside the chapel, she does the ceremony as expected. Nothing really stands out because she's done this a million times. At the end though, her family is standing in the door to the temple after hearing that Ferdinand is leaving, but she can't exactly do anything here with Hartmut watching her every move. So when the ceremony is over, she asks him if he understands what the high priest job is, and it's basically making sure she doesn't screw up. No way, Ferdinand does way more than that. But then Ferdinand goes ahead and confirms it. He didn't have to do nearly this much for Beze once. Well damn, talk about a hit to the ego. But Hartmut is jealous he didn't get a blessing for his coming of age, and asks if she'll bless him right now. Well, seems a bit odd and out of season, but why not? She decides on doing Gadul because she should be overseeing growth this season, and Hartmut is filled with joy to finally receive a blessing from his lady, especially since it was only for him. Ferdinand comments on how she has a good retainer, as long as she's able to keep him under control, but she asks what happens if she can't. Well, then you get Eckhart. Wait for the side stories. After the Starbind, Rosemine and Ferdinand are going to be in the castle for a while. Why? Turns out Georgine is planning to visit with Detlin so their duchies can get closer. Or so she says. I mean, crazy they're even allowed to considering the ob's health, but Ferdinand stomps that out. That's unverified, and even if it was, don't go blabbing about it because it would just look suspicious. It could also cause their source to be targeted, so don't go asking about ob Arnsbach's health when they're here. Besides, illness isn't the only way people might suspect their death is imminent. So Rosemind shifts the topic to how surprising it is that he and Detlin can even get married in the first place because he's her uncle. On Earth, that's a big no-no because incest, obviously. But Ferdinand clarifies that mana is all that really matters in Jürgen Schmidt, specifically since it's the mother who has the most influence. As long as they're not closely related on that side, it's fine, apparently. Hell, that's why she and Wilfried can get married in the first place, because they don't share a mom. And here I thought it was because she was adopted. Which brings up a valid point. Is he gonna bring anyone into the fold about her past life memories? And he decides not to. Her sainthood is so widespread at this point, it would just lead to her being exploited. However, she is losing the one person she can confide in about these differences between their perspectives. And Ferdinand gives her his invisible ink to write letters with. That way, she can send him secret messages to ask questions. And this leads into a good old-fashioned plot session, because they need to prepare for Georgine's return. Last time, she caused a ton of problems, so they need to be on guard. Ferdinand will be busy since he's going to be socializing, so he won't have much time. So she suggests that he have them bring Rymoon to make it more tolerable for him. That way he can have some discussion he enjoys. Other than that, enlist Elvira and Florencia to gather information on the female front. They got a hell of an information network already, considering they ran a faction while Veronica was in power. Yeah, this time they can't just hide away in the temple the whole visit. And with how much Georgine probably hates Ferdinand and Rosemine for getting Bezewans killed, they have a lot of preparations to make. Luckily, her guard knights are more capable this time around. But before this all kicks off, they need to settle Angelica's engagement. At a family meeting at Karstadt's estate, she tries the whole heartbroken act, and Elvira does like it as material for a book, but this is reality. She needs to get over it and decide who the hell she's gonna marry. Cornelius declines on the spot because he's gonna marry Leonore after she graduates, and it would look kinda bad if he took a second wife while engaged to his first. And Lamprex unable to because Aurelia is pregnant. 
Why does that matter? We'll get a lot more detailed explanation in part 5, but this series only has one real answer when it comes to that sort of stuff, and it's mana. Obviously. Well, more specifically, mana and intimacy. So the youngest men in the family can't take Angelica as their wife. Bonifatius is too old, and Karsted isn't really shopping around for a new third wife after Rosemary died. Angelica's only criteria for one is strength, so as long as they're more powerful than her, she's cool with whoever. Which basically just leaves Traugott as the only option again. So Bonifatius proposes the idea of beating him until he resembles a decent human being. And if he still isn't by the time he graduates, Bonifatius will take responsibility. Yeah. He's saying he'll marry Angelica. Well, Angelica's fine with that, but literally no one else is. Pretty much scrapping Elvira's idea for a love story in the process. After the Starbine ceremony, it's announced publicly that Ferdinand is marrying Det Lind, and a decent amount of the nobles, specifically the ones outside of the city proper, still didn't know. So the Veronica faction is ignited once more, with Elvira and Florencia watching them carefully. But when Georgine and Detlind arrive, Rosemine's gonna have to keep an eye on Ferdinand, since the longer he keeps up that fake smile, the bigger the disconnect between him and Detlind will be. But while doing this, she also has to make sure to keep Wilfried by her side, or else it could cause some rumors. It's the same reason Charlotte has to keep her distance as well. The issue is, this isn't exactly ideal because Rosemine isn't great in social situations and Wilfried can't pick up on subtleties. But suddenly they realize that Ferdinand actually needs a proposal face stone here. Did he make one? Well, no. He's actually using one he made during his school days that has some generic words and is rainbow colored. Yeah, basically screams he couldn't be bothered, but Ferdinand is confident he can sell it with some smooth talk. And if Rosemine is so invested in him making a new one, she can go do it herself, since she's his family. Yeah, he's just washing his hands of this whole mess. Remember that proposal face stones are meant to have an element of your partner as well as your own, and be pretty personalized. So this is definitely going to seem like an insult unless Ferdinand can hype it up. So let's see how the master cooks. Time for the welcoming feast. Georgine and her entourage arrive and they have a ton of gifts for Ironfest. Hell, Ehrenfest is pulling out all the stops too, with a few new recipes to advertise their value. That way Ferdinand isn't treated poorly when he gets there. As they're waiting for them to enter the hall, Wilfried and Rosemine go over the game plan with Charlotte and Melchior. They're not too worried about Charlotte since she's got experience in the Royal Academy, but Wilfried stresses to Melchior not to say anything other than what he's been told. That way he doesn't repeat Wilfried's mistake from Georgine's last visit. Hey, Bonifatius is there too. He usually avoids parties like this to tell people he's retired from politics, but he's there tonight as the kids' guards, keeping them extra safe. And it's at this point, Georgine enters the hall with Detlind behind her. Bonifatius even remarks how much Detlind looks like a young Veronica. Is Ferdinand really going to be okay with this girl? Well, considering the radiant smile on his face, he's probably sick just seeing her. But he is demonstrating the advice he beat into Rosemind from the very moment he started teaching her. Always wear a smile in noble society to hide your true feelings. Georgine takes the stage and they all greet her, with Melchior doing a perfect job for his first time greeting somebody so much higher in status. She then gives a small speech, dunking on Sylvester the whole time, before moving on to the exchanging of the face stones. Tatlin steps forward with her attendant Martina carrying the face stone in a box. She recites a Bible passage that basically boils down to be thankful I'm saving you and his life belongs to her. Rosemine wasn't entirely sure she got the meaning right until she noticed that Ferdinand's smile broadened quite a bit. Also used to having to hold Eckhart back. But he takes the stone, puts it in a box, and then presents Detlend his. Sure enough, he dresses it up in flowery language she can't parse. But judging by how every woman in the room is swooning, it must be beautiful. Brunhilde translates that he's extolling the lengths he went to for the ingredients, and how hard he fought despite the abruptness of their engagement. Damn, Ferdinand smooth. Even Rosemine would have fallen for it if she didn't know better. And poor Detlind. She's pretty damn smitten. So far, we know that Detlind is pretty self-absorbed and confrontational, but here's where we finally see the true depth of her character. Or perhaps lack of depth is a better way of putting it. If you don't hate her yet, these next few books are going to change your mind. So after that, Ferdinand and Detlind have to go around and greet everyone, while Rosemind spots a wild Rymund. She calls out to him and asks him to look after Ferdinand and Arnsbach, but he's already a mixture of stoked and incredibly nervous to be taken as a retainer once Ferdinand moves. Yeah, the pressure's on and his research time just flew out the window. Well, speaking of that, she asks him to work on a voice recorder and make it as small as possible. And that actually sounds like a worthwhile challenge for him. But then Ferdinand interrupts and says he's invited Detlin to his estate, but they're still engaged and can't go there alone. So he needs her and Wilfried to come along as well, 
keep things proper. She gets them to allow Charlotte and Melchior to come too, under the guise of cousins, and it sounds like a good way to ensure that Ferdinand doesn't ignore his guest. Speaking of that, he summons her the next day to sort this all out. His estate doesn't really have any servants, so he asks to borrow hers to fill out his staff. She's actually cool with that, and even throws in Hugo and Ella for the night to make sure things go smoothly. But as expected, Detlind wishes to order a hairpin as well, an order that she's gonna do herself. So she says that she and Charlotte can handle Detlind while he retreats into conversation with Raimund about research. So this also means they're summoning the Gilberta company too. So at the day of their visit, all of the Archduke candidate kids are traveling by carriage. This is Wilfried's first time visiting Ferdinand's estate, and come to think of it, it's Rosemine's first time too. It's not a very long trip either, since apparently it's right next to the castle. Also, it's fucking huge. Fran answers the door, which throws Charlotte and Wilfried for a loop, but when they realize that Ferdinand is leaving Ehrenfest soon and never really needed servants at his house in the first place, it makes sense why he would just borrow Rosemines. Besides, Fran and Zom originally served him anyway. Inside, there's almost no decorations, reminding her of Dunkel Felger's tea room, but Ferdinand is into practicality above everything else, so he wasn't gonna waste his money. With that settled though, Ferdinand lays out his plans. Once the Gilberta company arrives, he's gonna take the male scholars and Raimund into his book room for a research discussion while they handled that lint. Color Rosemine jealous because hell, she wants to go too. Ferdinand's personal book room? Wow, that sounds like a blast. Maybe she'll even find that book Eustace rescued from the lower city that she wanted as a commoner. If you remember, he kinda laughed about her never being able to read it. <laughs> now who's laughing? Well. Her joining is shot down, obviously. That is until a compromise is met. Keep the parlor and book room doors open so the guests can go between them. That'll probably put Detlind at ease. Being able to see her fiancé, and Rosemine can be the female bridge that allows her to enter the book room herself. Otherwise, it'd probably feel like a male space and she wouldn't want to go in. Sounds good, so that works. Besides, Ferdinand grasps that she'd probably be dead weight in that conversation anyway with so many books close by. So he shows her the book room and she fires out a blessing because she's so happy. And Ferdinand doesn't let her in. Why is that? He predicted her blessing and didn't want to have Detlind see her weirdness. With the rest of her mana clumps dissolved, she might be less likely to collapse, but a lot more likely to fire off random blessings. When Detlind arrives, they sit down for some sweets, and she has ice cream for the first time. She likes it a lot and suggests that Ferdinand bring the chef responsible to Arnsbach, but he refuses, saying their ingredients are unlike Arnfest, so he won't be bringing a chef. He's using Aurelia as a precedent here since she didn't bring a chef either. Slick move. Though Aurelia did bring ingredients, because she was denied a chef by her family, which Martina says she would love to give her sister some food if they could actually meet, but Lamprecht isn't allowing that, and neither is Wilfried his lord, since Aurelia lives with Karstedt and it's a security risk. Plus Aurelia refused herself. So Aurelia's family situation will be elaborated on a bit more in part 5, specifically volume 3. But Martina tries to play off their abuse here as accidental. Make no mistake, it's intentional. Detlin asks Ferdinand to allow the meeting, but he can't because it's outside his control. So Detlin dresses up an insult and calls him useless to Martina, and both Rosemine and Eckhart are incredibly annoyed. Martina picks up on the tension and tries to get Detlin to rein it in, but just before things boil over, the Gilberta company arrives, and Rosemine takes her leave. Inside the book room, she wants her retainers to make a registry of everything there, but Ferdinand has it already made. It's even organized by what she has and hasn't read. They then talk to Raimund about magic tools, specifically her teleportation circle is ready. They give it a try with Daniel and Felina as the test subjects, and estimate that a lay noble could do it about 10 times, which is honestly pretty impressive. Rosemind's pleased by that and buys it on the spot. Raimund's reluctant to sell it at first, but Ferdinand says that he did the legwork and deserves the money. Usually the teacher takes the credit for the student's work, and therefore the money too. Ferdinand gives him the blueprint for the sound recorder tool, and tells him to make it smaller and able to record an infinite number of times. Now that sounds simple, but it's actually a pretty tall order, to the point they're borrowing circles from Schwartz and Weiss just to preserve their recordings. Damn, and cram all that into a single face tone? Yeah, it won't be easy. After that, Ferdinand lets her read to distract her from being nervous about the scholar coursework next year, seeing how Hartmut and Raimund immediately grasped the concept based on that hint, but she was at a loss on how to proceed. Yeah, she's not so confident now. But this hairpin meeting would be their last visit with Detlin this summer, because she got an urgent summons to go back to Arnsbach. As she and Georgine left, all the Ehrenfest people give a generic farewell of hope we'll meet again someday, but Georgine gives one that says they'll meet again soon 
with a pretty evil smile on top of it. Wow, that was a hell of a way to end our main story, especially since it felt so abrupt. But what's really on the horizon here? Ferdinand's future looks pretty bleak, and Rosemine's not too optimistic. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We have an epilogue still. We pick up as soon as the Arnsbach group left the city from Detlin's perspective. She's not that happy to be heading home so soon, since that means more work and studying will be forced on her. But it's made clear here why they're leaving. Yeah, the Ob has collapsed with illness. Well, damn. Detlin doesn't really care though, since she has hardly any memories of her father, except a few where he wasn't super nice. Basically, she doesn't like him. The Sovereign Knight's Order has been a pain in their ass since spring, and that's probably what put her father under with the stress and accusations. But Georgine smiles and says it was well worth it. They cleared their suspicion and gives her thanks to the Goddess of Harvest, even. Yeah, that's kind of weird. Detland hated this whole thing, though, since she's going to be the next Ob Arnsbach. She apparently had a fling with a knight from the Sovereignty over spring, but when her engagement was announced, that had to end. Not that she's really holding a grudge. Then there's Ferdinand, an older guy with temple connections from a duchy lower rank than hers. But I guess it's fine since he's handsome and intelligent. Surely he understands his role in supporting her as the next Archduchess. Plus he's pulling Rosemine's strings, and all of his trends will soon belong to Arnsbach. When that happens, she'll be able to stand in front of Adolfina with her hairpin and gloat. But the fact that Detlind ordered her own hairpin without any input from Ferdinand seems to have Georgine pausing. I mean, only for a moment, and she clearly loses interest, which tells us a few things. Her daughter's not only delusional, but also an idiot. They're keeping her in the dark about a few things, too, like the whole temporary ob thing. But one of the biggest takeaways is Georgine doesn't really seem to care if she succeeds or fails. After they reach a town to rest for the night, Detlin notes that the food there isn't as good as it is in the castle, which makes it clear that Arnfest is dressing itself up in the academy, and it's still just a backwater duchy. But the next day, Georgine wants their carriage to depart, while they go by High Beast to Aguib's mansion. Detlin zones out because her input has never really been considered before, so why bother even listening? And the author draws attention to her tea being refreshed. The next day, she's not any less tired despite sleeping and just chalks it up to the crappy inn. But as they fly by High Beast, something is clearly wrong. She's got a fever, has been reaching for her rejuvenation potions, and is just struggling. After the retainers raise a fuss, Detlin still wants to race to Arnsbach so they can sleep at a mansion there. But Georgine instead takes them to Gerlach. Upon meeting Nagib there, he's pleased to see Georgine. But Detlin briefly questions how he got there so quickly. Yeah, something's up. But she's too sickly to really think it over at this point. Everything with Georgine reeks of ulterior motives and layers of schemes. Like she has some sort of master plan that we're only just capturing a glimpse of. It's pretty clear that Detlind is just a useful idiot for said schemes. And the build up for what Georgine is after is probably the longest in the entire series. So what exactly is she plotting? Who knows? Because every time it seems like they just thwart her schemes, they still seem to pop off in dangerous ways later. Well, let's go ahead and dig into the side stories before we get too far into the weeds, because that's starting to deal with some part 5 plot threads. First, we have clearing regrets from 10 years ago from Heisitz's perspective. At the Archduke conference, he's sitting in on the talks between Dunkelfelger and Arnsbach as a guard, when he hears some interesting discussion. They want to build a stronger relationship between their two duchies, because they're both managing old workstock, and Hildebrand is marrying into their duchy when he comes of age. Arnsbach doesn't really have the knights to spare at the moment, so this leads to them complaining about their lack of Archduke candidates too. Isitza feels for them, but ultimately decides it's not really any of his concern. <laughs> that is until Ferdinand's name comes up. Georgine and the Ob both want him to marry Det Lind, but he refused. This gets Heitzitza thinking that maybe if Ferdinand was in a greater duchy, they could hunt Fabies together in old workstock and even play Ditter. So he begs the first wife of Dunkelfelger, Sieglind, to help persuade the king to intervene, as that's what Arnsbach is planning to do. She doesn't want to because she doesn't see how it benefits their duchy, but Heitzitza says this is all because he screwed up Ferdinand's life. Their dinner match led to him missing a talk with Arnsbach at the tournament, but that's not all. He also tried to set Ferdinand up with Magdalena, a former Archduke candidate of Dunkelfelger to free Ferdinand from his torment in Ehrenfest. That was back when they went to school together. Now their information is outdated because they assume he's still being mistreated because he's staying in the temple, and he wants to make amends, since his meddling led to Ferdinand being denied the chance to flee when he graduated which at the time was something Ferdinand wanted. But also, they didn't clear any of this with Magdalena back then, and it pissed her off. She used that as leverage to secure marriage to the man she loved, the fifth prince, who's now the current king and is his third wife. Or to put it better, 
Hildebrand's mother. Sieglin doesn't care because that's just cleansing his guilt, but after talking it over with the other knights that night, he realizes they could probably swing this with their backing to make Arnsbach indebted to them, and that would in turn give them priority access to Lanzanov goods. Okay, so that might work. Especially if they get Druanchel involved too, since they want Ferdinand to flourish because of his mind. So with that, they plow on ahead and stick their noses where it didn't really belong. Next, we have 10 years of change from Eckhart's perspective. He's dragged to the Archduke conference with Ferdinand where he finds out after his meeting what's up. Yeah, it's stupid and it pisses him off that Arnsbach would even suggest something like that. Don't they remember? They attacked Rosemine and have been a thorn in Ferdinand's side. The fact they're complaining about any cruelty at all is a laugh, since they've gone and meddled in their duchy for no damn reason. The former Veronica faction nobles at the conference try to get Ferdinand to reconsider, but Eckhart sees that as stupid too. Ten years ago, this would have been welcome to get away from Veronica, while also spiting her pretty hard. But everyone knows that Arnsbach is a sinking ship. Why the hell would Ferdinand jump on board? Besides, the former Veronica faction killed Eckhart's late wife. So, screw them. But as we already know from the main story, he was summoned back and accepted the proposal from the king. Eckhart's even more frustrated now, but offers a really helpful suggestion of just killing the king so they don't have to accept. Ferdinand tells him to knock it off as that would just cause more problems than fixing them, which is what he said to him when Eckhart suggested killing Veronica. Back in Ehrenfest, Ferdinand summons Eustace and Eckhart to his estate. They're greeted by his lay noble attendant named Lazfam, Ferdinand's third name sworn, who proved his loyalty by giving his name and not treating Ferdinand poorly when they attended the academy. Ferdinand then pulls out all their name stones and places them on the table. They're all immediately worried that he's going to return them, but instead, he pours his mana in causing them pain and gives them a single undefiable order. If they choose not to obey, it will actually kill them. He orders Eustace and Eckhart to follow him into Arnsbach. And of course they accept, because they were waiting for that very order. Now Lazfam can't protect himself, so he's gonna stay behind until Ferdinand has an estate, and it's safe enough for him to come. After Ferdinand leaves for his preparations, Eustace and Eckhart chat a bit, where Eustace tells Eckhart to sort out his affairs. He has an estate that he plans to leave to Cornelius since he's marrying Leonore, and they're gonna need a place to live at some point soon, and also to settle his engagement with Angelica. Now, she would actually be useful to have an Arnsbach with her skills and strength, but when he brings it up to her, she doesn't quite know how to answer. That's when Cornelius jumps in and begs him not to end the engagement, but Eckhart just tells him to shut it. After all, he's only begging because he's worried about being forced to marry Angelica instead. So, just use Leonore as an excuse? That'll work. In the end, Angelica refuses because she serves Rosemine, and not Ferdinand. So she'll support Rosemine while she fights for Ferdinand on this side. That's when Eckhart realizes that things aren't the same as they were. There are people who care about Ferdinand now. It sucks they can't stay now that Ehrenfest has changed, but he swears that he'll make Arnsbach a comfortable place for his lord. Wow, those are some useful side stories, as we got a lot of background on Ferdinand's circumstances. Not from him, but from those close to him, and also how these current circumstances shaped up. This is honestly where the side stories shine because they elaborate on current events from other perspectives. And these aren't just one-off ordeals, these will be referenced as the story goes on. But enough about that, since they don't come up until about the middle of part 5, let's wrap this video up with my final thoughts. This volume feels like a bit of an in-between due to just how short it is, and honestly the lack of substantial things happening in it. But what it does contain is a ton of foreshadowing for the next volume in part. Just because it feels like a launching pad sort of entry doesn't mean it isn't important. Hell, I'd say that makes the details even more so than you'd expect. During Melchior's baptism, Rosemine says the elements that he has, and if he dedicated himself to becoming worthy of their protection, he'll receive many blessings. Now, this is something that's been said in every baptism she's performed to this point, but now we've also seen it show up somewhere much more important, somewhere that led to issues last book. The Bible also mentioned that the king prays to receive blessings. So what originally seems like a piece of religious fluff that people say in this world is a bit of flavor, is actually hinting towards a deeper meaning. Earning blessings and protections of the gods is something people actually strive for. And once we get to part 5, we'll see the implications of it. Specifically why it makes sense that a priest would urge those being baptized to work hard to dedicate themselves for blessings and protections. Because the Bible's already hinting at it being important for the king. I love this because it's such a subtle bit of foreshadowing that works itself into the normal language of this world, but it's actually related to the culture and function of it, once we learn more about it in Rosemine's third year. In the early meeting with Ferdinand and Sylvester, Rosemine mentions that Aaron Fest's information gathering skills suck, 
and she's definitely right. Sadly, they're also currently the best they've ever been, and they're still severely lacking. Because she started paying students for information that was useful to different parts of the government, leading to them sharing and seeking out whatever rumors they could gather, they've seen a huge boon in what they know. But that's a recent development, and still not nearly as robust as it should be. The upper-ranking duchies all have a firm pulse on not just the royal academy and sovereignty, but each other and the lower-ranking duchies as well, because they pay attention to small details and make educated guesses on what they could mean, and how to deal with them if they're true. So essentially think of it like this. Hartmut's a really skilled scholar, but he's more of a standard in the upper-ranking duchies. We saw Martina doing this very thing when reporting to Georgine. Though what we saw was through Detlin's eyes, that meant she was tuning in and out while focusing on herself. But it shows what a real upper-ranked duchy should be doing. If you want proof of how bad Aaronfest's information network sucks, look no further than just how in the dark Wilfried is about Rosemind's activities. He's her brother, fiancé, and in the same duchy, and his scholars can't even report on what she's doing in the industry they're supposed to be involved in. Yeah, it's a pretty sad state. I really like how the Seed of Adelgisa thing plays out in this book, because it kinda seems like we got the full picture already. Why is that? Well, because it answered a lot of our immediate questions, and Ferdinand gave us a history on the villa and princesses. But it's also one of those elements that comes up in the story later on in a bigger way that impacts characters. And I love just how resolved it feels until you actually think about it critically, because you feel like Rosemine in that situation. Yeah, your questions are answered. You have a good idea of what Adelgisa is, so you feel satisfied. Especially after Ferdinand connects the dots of why he's being targeted for that reason. But because of that, you're overlooking some other key information that was dropped in that very scene. Like, why does the Sovereign Knights Commander even know about that villa? Even Ferdinand speculates that he worked there at some point. So what does that mean for the story going forward? Well, just keep it in mind as you see Rob Loot in future volumes, as his behavior makes a ton more sense when it gets recontextualized in mid-part 5. But we already got some interesting information that's giving you the breadcrumbs this volume. Ferdinand's speculation, and Georgine talking about the Sovereign Knight's investigation being fruitful for her. Okay, so I've joked and hinted at how bad the inbreeding is in this world, but we finally got an actual answer on what's acceptable. If you share a close relative on your mother's side, then marriage can't happen, because, just like everything else noble-related, the mother's mana influences the baby the most. Now, cousins are fair game in general, but this also means by implication and somewhat flat-out stated, half-siblings who share a father but not a mother can legally get married in this world. Now, that sounds pretty bad, and from our standards it is, but this is also the same loophole that's allowing Rosemine to marry Wilfried and stay in Arenfest. Now, you'd think it'd be because she's adopted and doesn't share any blood relatives at all, but no, it's stated it's specifically because they don't share mother, despite them being brother and sister. So whether half-siblings are actually getting married, or if it's just a legal fiction that exists so adopted children can marry blood children, isn't really elaborated on. And that's probably for the best, honestly. What this does mean, though, is it's definitely historically accurate to medieval aristocracies. Inbreeding is common, and as far as we can tell, it's not having an adverse effect on the noble population. I guess humans are just built different, Jürgen Schmidt. This volume leaves off on a massive cliffhanger, with some big questions and even bigger implications. Detlin seems to have been drugged because, well, she got really tired after drinking some tea the night before. Also the whole fever thing. And the reason they were called back is because Ob Arnsbach's health took a turn for the worse. We know Georgine is a ruthless, vindictive person, so we're left with some heavy foreshadowing that she's either poisoned her family, because as stated earlier in the book, the first wife died unexpectedly as well and should have been alive. But what's going on exactly isn't something we're quite privy to yet. And as we're going to find out in the next few books, drugs aren't exactly outside her wheelhouse. Georgine has plans. And that's obvious, even from Rosemine's perspective, since she mentions how much more lively Georgine looks to be back in Arenfest. But that mixed with Rauvlut's connection to Adol Gisa, his trip to Arnsbach from last volume's epilogue, and what we're gonna learn later, this plot goes deeper than we could even suspect. At the time I'm recording this video, I don't even know the full extent, but all these threads come up later on down the line, and they're worth pointing out here. So with that, we're bringing Volume 8 to a close. Rosemine had a roller coaster of a time, sorting out the Lies Gang drama, studying for her next year in the Academy, and hearing about the news of Ferdinand's soon departure. But on top of that, Georgine's got a massive scheme afoot. And after her last visit, we know that'll probably spell disaster for Rosemine. So what's gonna come of that? We'll find out in the last volume of Part 4, where Rosemine finally has to grow up because the last of her support pillars are taken away from her. But for now though, hey, you've made it to the end of the video. 
Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and do all the other YouTube stuff to help the channel grow. You can also join my Discord with a link down in the description. And if you really want to support me, you can head on over to my Patreon and pick up some extra perks. And speaking of Patreon, I'd like to give a special thanks to Honorwolf01, JMunt33A, RobinDBL, Samuel Chen, and Shriken for their continued support. Thanks for watching.